15, verse number one, it says, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? Just one verse. Who may dwell in your holy tent? Who may live in your holy mountain? Father, we come grateful to you for this day. To hear the words of James Weldon Johnson say, we've come over a way that with tears have been watered. Out of the gloomy past, still now we stand at last, where the bright gleam of our bright star is cast. Over in the third verse you say, shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand true to our God, true to our native land. We come this morning grateful for this sanctified hour to be able to sing praise and worship to you and to recognize it's all about you and not about us, but we are so thankful to be children of God. We are so thankful to be present. We are so thankful that you never leave us and you never forsake us. And that we don't need to question where you are because you are always taking care and tending to us. I pray your blessings over this word. I pray your blessings over the hearers. I pray your blessings over the messenger. And I pray that we will be indeed blessed. We thank you for our time together and pray, Lord, never to take you for granted. And I pray the power of your wonderful spirit continues to hover in this place that we might hear everything that you need to give us in the midst of this pandemic. In your son Jesus' name we pray as we pray for every church and every house of worship that's open in your name that we would abide and do what you have called us to do. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. You may be seated. There are a number of different translations of the Bible. Many of us grew up on King James. I'm, I'm one of them. And in fact, I memorized so many parts of the King James Bible that, you know, because we had contests when I was growing up. A amen, somebody. I, I know I'm 100 and most of y'all are not, but, but I know that we used to do stuff like that. And it was really wonderful to have Trivia Pursuit Bible Trivia Pursuit. Do I have a witness? Was, I, was that only in Ohio that we did that? <laughs> Amen. And, and I have learned, and I'm grateful because all of the other uh, translations of the Bible really give us an opportunity to teach and to really help. Because sometimes, truthfully, the King James is hard to understand because it's not uh, present-day English. It's, you know, it's, it's English of 600 years ago. And it's very difficult. And quite frankly, I, I don't say that as just an issue for us. Uh, I've got friends who uh, have our native tongue to Hebrew or to Greek, and they have the same problem translating the Torah or translating the New Testament in their language of Greek because it's not conversational Greek is not the same as biblical Greek. Conversational Hebrew is not the same as biblical Hebrew, and I sure found that out when I went to seminary, because I was sure I was going to ace Hebrew. Y'all don't hear me, because I knew I had spoken enough of it. It was not going to be a problem. I got in there about lost my mind when I realized it wasn't the same. C come on, y'all. You might as well. E even though you didn't experience it, I want you to experience it with me and just know that your pastor sat in that class and thought I was like a deer in the headlights. There was just so much that I realized I was going to have to get myself up to speed on. And uh, I laughed at Elder Lewis because he did his right. He started out at the beginning in his languages. For me, it was at the end. And quite frankly, there were some of my colleagues who, who dropped out and said, forget it. I can't do the language, so I'm going to uh, I'm gonna take the Master of Arts in Religion or whatever was the offering that made it so that you did not have to uh, use the languages of Greek or Hebrew. And, and when I was going through, you had to do Greek, 
Hebrew and then an exegesis of one or the other in that language. The, I, I chose Hebrew and we did uh, the book of Ruth. And what a amazing, really, the depth of the language helps you understand the word of God so much more. It really does. And me and my crazy self was saying, y'all can drop out if you want to. I'm going through this. I know this is going to be hard, but I'm going through it anyway. Amen? Because I also knew that I had a desire to, uh, to, to buy for a doctoral degree. And, and if you didn't have the Masters of Divinity, you could not be a candidate for the doctorate. And so it was like, well, I'm going to get through this somehow. Amen? And God, thank the Lord. Y'all hear me? If somebody's had a class like this before, thank the Lord. He gave, us the, uh, gave me the opportunity to get through, and I'm just really grateful. And, and I rely on that, and I say that today because in so many cases, as I'm studying the word, exegeting the text, and trying to make sure that I can make sense of it for you and I, I'm always happy to go back to the original Greek or to the original Hebrew and understand because many times we are limited by the language of English. Uh, and, and, and amen. It doesn't always give us all the juice that the original languages do. And that, by the way, is part of what's happening in this psalm as well. As we look at this wonderful psalm of David, Psalm 15, and we realize that it's a very simple passage. It says, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Lord, who may live on your holy mountain? And I want to put this in context first to help you understand what the original hearers were talking about. King David, as he looked at this text, as he wrote this text, King David realized that at the time we are writing, and scholars have tried to figure this out, and the best they could come to is that this must have been about the time that the Ark of the Covenant was introduced to the people. You have to understand that the original Israelites really had a problem understanding that their God was so big that he was present all the time. Uh, I'm going to try that one more time because somebody missed that on the way by. They had a hard time believing that God could be present everywhere they were at all times. They had a hard time with that. And as they were more nomadic, they realized that I've gone from here to there. I didn't see God nowhere. Y'all catch that? They sure sound like some of us, don't they? Amen. I, I ain't seen God nowhere. I don't know if you're talking about that God is here because I don't see God. And, and the problem for them was is that they needed to understand that their God and relationship was not all about what you could see. Lord, I'm going somewhere. Y'all better come stay with me on this one. Because, you see, if it was all about what you could see, there'd be many of us that would not have a relationship with God at all. But I came to tell you that one of the things I love about the relationship we have with God is that I may not be able to see him, but I sure know how to feel him. I got a witness here somewhere, right? They couldn't believe it. And so God, as you remember, God gave him a king even though they didn't need a king. God gave him all kinds of things. Gave him manna because he knew he didn't have Safeway in the wilderness. Y'all don't hear me. God gave him all kinds of things. And yet God decided once again to give them something that would give them assurance that God was with them. And what he gave them was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is like a big box with a top on it. And that was carried, by the way, with long handled arms on the front and the back. And they carried that because what that showed us is that tangibly they could see that as a result of the Ark of the Covenant, God was with us. Tell me more about that, preacher. I, I, I will. The top of the Ark of the Covenant is called the mercy seat. And, 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 and it covers what's on the inside. What's on the inside is more than man can bear. And what's on the inside is the essence of God himself. And what he said to all of them who carried the ark, remember when you carry the ark, never take the mercy seat off. Because that's where the power of God is. Lord, I'm going to preach this in a minute. The power of God is in the ark itself. Now let me be clear for somebody. Whatever's in the ark the symbolic power of God was also in the ark. But I need to tell you that even though that's where the power was symbolized, 
God was not contained in the ark. This was only a symbol. Lord Jesus, this is a Bible study, and I'm sure getting happy in the Bible study. And, 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 and the people needed this tangible understanding of what it would be like to have God with us at all times. Let me tell you one other thing about that. There was a belief that if you had the Ark of the Covenant, that God was not only with you, but there was no battle that would come before you that would cause you to lose. That whoever had the Ark of the Covenant, they were always going to win the battle. I don't know whether you ever saw the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, one of my favorite, uh, with uh, what's my man's name in there? You guys see y'all, y'all all right. Yeah, there you go. Harrison Ford. He was replicating a period of time when Hitler was trying to take over the world. And indeed, there was a search for the Ark of the Covenant, because there was a belief, if you look at that film, there's a belief that if the Ark of the Covenant was on your side, that you would win everything. And the reality is they couldn't find the Ark of the Covenant. I don't need to keep going in that, but just understand that even when they found what they assumed was the Ark of the Covenant, uh, God still, even in the film, even in the film, God show, that they did a beautiful job of showing what God would do. Amen. When they were trying to figure out, excuse me, what was on top, what was below the mercy seat. The word tells us that David is writing this psalm and David sees and hears what others have to say. David is watching the people. And let me just tell you that sometimes people can get in a tizzy. I know that y'all never get in a tizzy. Somebody said, Pastor, what does a tizzy mean? When y'all going crazy, when we've got issues, you understand. When we, oh, that's right, I like this. You know how we call it. We don't call it tizzy anymore. I'm feeling some kind of way. Right? I'm feeling some kind of way about the way you talked to me. I'm feeling some kind of way about the way you looked at me. I'm feeling some kind of way about the fact that you walked by me and didn't say nothing. That's called a tizzy. That, that, that's what that is. The people were in a tizzy. And by the way, often we can be in a tizzy. Y'all, won't y'all stay with me on this? We can be in a tizzy. It messes our whole spirit up. It messes our attitude up. It messes relationship up. It messes our day up because we get in a tizzy. Y'all don't have to say amen. I know what I'm talking about because I've seen some of y'all in church coming in here in a tizzy. And then want to take it out on everybody else. And you want, you want me to call some of your names and some of y'all sitting there looking like it couldn't possibly be you? You might as well go on and praise the Lord because you don't want me to have to call on your name. You know very well that you'll walk in here, got hell on your mind, and going to stay in here with it on too. I'm going somewhere. That's right. Y'all might as well laugh. Some of y'all anyway. I'm watching you. Got your mask on. I'm watching you anyhow. A amen. When we are in the midst of a tizzy, we are in the midst of a personal pandemic because what happens to us is everything we have known, everything we've been taught goes out the door and we allow the tizzy to take over. I came to tell you that when that happens, we are bereft, meaning that we have lost our spirituality. We've lost what we've been taught. We've lost what we have believed. We've lost our faith, and we feel some kind of way. But I came to tell you, God didn't give you the power of the Holy Spirit for it to come and go. God did not give you the power that he has inside him for you and me, for us to act like somehow we have the right to get feeling some kind of way and just have our own personal pandemic because we need to understand that everything that he gives us is an opportunity to say, I can't handle this, Lord. I need to give this to you. Because I'm determined to have a good time. I'm determined. And I got news for you. When y'all see me grinning, I ain't always going through Easy Street and God had made Boulevard either. Somebody didn't get that. I, I want y'all to catch that. 
I, I'm not always sitting on the corner of Easy Street and Got It Made Boulevard either, but here's the one thing I know. When I decide to get down, did y'all hear that? I didn't say when I get down. I said when I decide to get down, all I'm doing is giving the devil a victory, and I've got news for you. I ain't giving up no ground to the devil in my life. He is not going to do that to me. You are not going to depress me. You're not going to mess with me. You're not going to make me lose my faith. You are not going to let me get messed up with me in my life and make me think that God can't handle what's going on in my life. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. That's what we need to remember. God's given us that. The people of Israel, the Israelites, they just were messed up and in a tizzy and in a personal spiritual pandemic because we need to see some tangible will or, or some tangible thing that tells us that God is with us. The Bible tells us, David tells us, I'm going to hurry up and get this done. David tells us in this divine reality that as long as you want to be in a tizzy and a personal pandemic, you're going to be there. Y'all didn't catch that, so, so let me help you. What he's telling us is you have control over your own emotions. You have control over your reaction. You have control over whatever comes your way. You have control. And if I've got control, what in the world am I up here acting a fool about deciding I'm going to be in a tizzy because I've gotten some cards that don't look very good? I came to tell you that the text is telling us, David is telling us, somebody is saying, now that we got this ark, y'all don't hear me, now that we got this big box, that this is where God dwells, now that we've got it, who can hang around it? Y'all, see, see y'all, y'all, y'all were up here, y'all, y'all were up here, not, y'all, y'all thought Pastor done lost, see, he don't know where he's going with this. That's the text, the text is, the text says, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? Watch this. The original Greek, original Hebrew, tells us as we exegete this passage of Scripture that the question that David was asking on behalf of the people because he had heard it is that they were really asking this. Y'all ready for 21st century language with this? Who can do a drive-by? Y'all don't, y'all don't hear me. Who can have a spiritual drive-by when it comes to the presence of God? And you see, it doesn't take much to do a drive-by because all it causes you to do is to go near it and you don't have to be in it. Watch, watch out, I'm going somewhere. You better stay with me on this one. Uh, do, do you want, and see, the reason why some of us get all messed up and, and allow ourselves to be in a spiritual pandemic is because we haven't figured out that the reason why we're messed up is because we're too busy giving God drive-bys and determine that we're just going by. We're not going in. We're not sitting down. We're not allowing God to take residence in us. And what we're doing is giving God that'll do and not giving God our full self. Oh, Lord Jesus. Y'all know I shouted when I was doing this myself, right? I, I, I had myself a shouting good time. The Bible tells us, as we exegete this text, that what we need to understand is that you have the power. You, 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 you want to you keep going through life, getting mad every moment you have, grumbling all the time, upset about stuff, got an attitude, feeling some kind of way. Got yourself in a tizzy. I got news for you. You're the one that's got control of the tizzy button. Y'all didn't hear me. You've got control over the tizzy button. You've got control over the pandemic button. Somebody says, well, Pastor, you just don't understand. I got news for you. You ain't seen where I come from. 
Don't judge me by based on what you see me coming from now. I've been in that spiritual desert myself before. But you see, I found out that hanging out in the desert ain't no place to be. Not only is it hot, it's full of mirages. What do you mean, preacher? It's full of things that look like water. They're not water at all. It's full of images that try to make you think that you're almost out. I got news for you. Don't hang out in the desert because it's got an awful a lot of things in it that'll make you believe that you've got somewhere going somewhere. You're going nowhere if you hang out in the desert. As the word says, the question is, who can come by? Huh? And then the other part of the question says, who can dwell? That, that's what live means. Live means who may live on your holy mountain, meaning who can dwell on your holy mountain. And, the tw- and, and again, The choice is yours. The choice is mine. I come to you and tell you today that the issue for the church is not giving God a spiritual drive-by. The spirit of the church ought to be to recognize, I'm going to stay and dwell in, not by. I'm going somewhere with this. Do you hear my choice of preposition was, am I going in the church or am I going by the church? You see, if I go by the church, I'm going to miss the singing. Come on, somebody. If I go by the church, I'm going to miss some praying. If I go by the church, I'm going to miss some fellowship. I'm going somewhere. You better stick with me here because this is serious stuff. If I go by the church... I'm going to see some things, but I'm not going to know some things. If I go by the church, you see, that's the way I read my Bible, is that sometimes what's happening, and the reason why you're not getting so much out of this, you're too busy driving by and not dwelling in. Because, see, when you dwell in, you begin to dig into the Word of God, and it begins to speak to you, and it deals with the issues you're dealing with when you dwell in and not drive by. As long as all you're doing is driving by, that's all you're going to get. But when you decide, I'm going to dwell in, I promise you, You're going to get what the songs are all about. Not only are you going to hear the music, you're going to feel the experience. Do I have a witness here? Somebody's going to go back and remember just how far God has brought you. You're going to remember just what God has taken you through. When you realize that this is not a drive-by, this is, uh, do, do I have a witness here? This is called dwelling in. That's what the old folks used to mean when they say we got a mourner's bench. Hallelujah. Some of y'all know what a mourner's bench looks like. Some remember the old deacons when they would pray. They didn't pray like we prayed. They got down on their knees, and they may pray a while. As a matter of fact, for some of us, we thought that was a long time, but we didn't know what Deacon Hickenlooper had been through. And when Deacon Hickenlooper was down on his knee, Deacon Hickenlooper was thinking about what God had done for him, thinking about what somebody had told him during the week, somebody that was ready to give up, but they started giving back to God. He was praying because he knew that God could do anything but fail. David said, don't come around just driving by. Come around and dwell within. The text reminds us that the reality is that the strength of our faith The ability for us to have relationship has everything to do with what we decide to do with our relationship with God. That if what we have is a transactional relationship, then you're going to have a transactional relationship with God. What does that mean, preacher? I'm glad you asked. I'm not going to tell you explicitly what it means, but what it means is that we are dealing with God as if he has office hours. Do I have a witness? During this pandemic, Walmart used to stay open 24 hours. And if you were a Walmart shopper, of which I are one, you had to change everything because Walmart opened at 7 and closed at 8.30. And see, I liked going at midnight 
and one in the morning so people wouldn't be talking to me so much and I can get my groceries. Y'all don't hear me. I, I, I don't mind answering people's questions, but I didn't go to Walmart to answer your question. I, I didn't go to Walmart to heal you. Y'all, y'all don't. See, see, I know, I, I know, I, I know, I know. Every now and then your pastor has to be just human. A- amen? And so I'd go at 1 o'clock in the morning because it was easy because people were not there and I could go shop and get out of there. And besides that, I like to shop, grocery shop anyhow. Amen? But what I realized is that once the pandemic hit, Walmart had to make some changes. They could not be the Walmart that we know. As a matter of fact, Winco did the same thing, and they shortened their hours. And Fred Meyer did the same thing and shortened its hours. When you're in the midst of a pandemic, it changes everything. And when you're in a spiritual pandemic, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to round third and head for home. When you're in a spiritual pandemic, it messes up everything. Normally, you know, people wouldn't know that you're so cute, but every time you turn around, you're not grinning, you're frowning. And what you need to understand is you use less muscle smiling than you do frowning. I know I've got some health people in here who know that that's the truth. You lose less muscle, use less muscle smiling than you do frowning. And I need people to know that in the midst of a spiritual pandemic, in the midst of feeling some kind of way, you need to understand that God has made provision for you to give whatever you've got to him. I don't know about you, but I'm saying to you, you need to understand that where you stand is holy ground, that any one of God's children, wherever you stand is holy ground. Guess what? The devil wants to take you off target all the time. The devil wants to mess you up any way that he can, and as long as you feel some kind of way spiritually, oh, he'll get to you, and whatever was small gets a lot bigger. But I came to tell you, when you decide This is God's ground. This is God's tabernacle. This is God's holy place. You're not going to let all that mess get to you anymore because this is God's house. This is God's place. No, I'm not going to let anybody get near me that's going to hurt me because I got to protect God's house. What do you mean, preacher? Because some of us are only in the 12th grade when it comes to getting over cussing. You understand. You've been sitting at the cussmobile for an awfully long time. You can put any other thing that that we know that we do or say uh, often. We we, we realize that we, we have not graduated yet. But you see, what we need to understand, you're never going to graduate as long as you like it that much. Y'all don't have to say, man, I know it's true. And look, if you decide never to listen to what the pastor says, that's at your own peril. Because, you see, I'm determined to not only preach it, I'm going to live it. I'm going to walk it myself. I'm going to deal with this and show that this is a reality. Because, you see, I get hit upside the head all the time. There are people always got something to say bad about me. You know what? I don't care what they say. I know that I'm going to do God's work. I know that I'm doing what he's called me to be. Somebody in the street the other day said to me, you know, nobody elected you. I said, you know what? I didn't stand for election either. I said, I got news for you. It was not my choice. To be where I am, but I know one thing's for sure. If no other preacher is going to stand up for the people of God, I'm sure going to stand up for them because what I know is somebody needs to, and the church needs to be the mouthpiece. The church needs to be the leader. The church needs to open up its mouth. The church needs to show people this is what love is all about. This is what forgiveness is all about. This is what transformation is all about. And most people aren't elected to do that. I said I didn't want to be a preacher either, but that was God's business. I've got got news for you. It's still God's business. You may not want to do what it is that you are doing, but if God called you to do it, you sure better go get it done because he is looking to you to get it done. David said, do you want to drive by or do you want to live in it? And today, the message is, the reality is that as long as you do drive-by, you're going to have a drive-by spirituality. 
But when you start dwelling in the place and the songs and the word and the experience begins to get to you, all of a sudden you realize you ain't driving by anymore. You are dwelling in, and there's a difference between dwelling in and driving by. And the Word of God tells us that you can not only dwell within, but you can live on his holy mountain. Do I have a witness? And every now and then you're going to have to go back to the valley. That's why I said this is a filling station. In other words, you come here to this high place to come in and get filled up with worship and praise and the word. When you go out of here, you're going back to the valley, back to all the skunks and snakes that are out there, all the snares that are out there, all the unbelievers that are out there. But when you get out there, I want you to show up with a smile on your face, show up with the word of God in your heart, show up with a song of victory, show up knowing that it's all going to be all right, show up and show somebody we're not giving up God's ground. We're going to protect God's ground. Amen. Amen. I'm done. I'm going down and preach this down there at the church down there. It's empty, but I'm going to preach it because I'm going to get more response. I'm just messing with you. Y'all stand and give God praise. Stand and give God praise. There might be somebody that wants to give their life to Christ, somebody who wants to renew their relationship. I got news for you. It's not always going to be easy. I know that. But what I know is it wasn't easy for Jesus, and he was perfect. And I, they talked about him. He was perfect. Hadn't done one thing, not one sin. He was perfect. But they talked about him anyway. That's why you and I need to quit going around here sulking because of what people say. Because when the devil can get you that easily, tells us you ain't got no roots in God in the first place. <laughs> but you see, it's when you can keep on going. <laughs> Y'all don't hear me. It's when you keep on going, and the devil is literally confounded because he cannot figure out why it is he throws his best stuff at you, his best stuff at me, and you keep on grinning and keep on going, and you don't seed the ground, and you keep on doing the work that God called you to do, and the devil's angry. Don't worry about it. God will fight that battle too. Amen. You don't have to fight it. I just want you to know that our job, your job, my job, don't just do a drive-by. Dwell. When it gets hard, dwell. When you feel like giving up, dwell. When you've been talked about, dwell. When you've gotten the impression that you can't go any further, dwell. That's what it's all about. That's your reality. That's my reality. More importantly, that's God's reality. He didn't set you up for you to lose. He set you up to be victorious. And every one of us needs to embrace victory because too often times we are embracing defeat. That's what a tizzy is all about. And a spiritual pandemic is all about you're embracing the wrong stuff. There was victory on the cross. Do I have a witness here? Th there was victory in the grave. Do I have a witness here? There was victory on the third day morning when he got up and said, I've got all power in heaven and earth in my hands. And today, that's the victory that you need to embrace and remember that you are victorious and that God has made you special and that you have every right to take this ground. You don't need an Ark of the Covenant. You've got a heart, a mind, and a spirit to be focused on who God is. Do I have a witness here today? Amen. Y'all can do better than that. This is not witness to me, but a witness to God. We're about ready to go. Do we have a song?